our, our first panelist to speak tonight will be Michael Carpenter. He's a postdoctoral fellow with the Borders in Globalization Project at the University of Victoria and a, a sessional instructor in the Department of Political Science. He studies and teaches civil disobedience Palestine, international relations, and political theory. He spent six months in the Israeli-occupied West Bank. He will speak about life under occupation, Palestinian popular resistance, and Canada's misguided policies. So please welcome Michael Carpenter. Everywhere you go, everywhere you go, folks are folks. People want to live, laugh, travel, start a family, make a few bucks. We must continue to resist the stereotypes, the demonization, and the othering that so often proves ca catastrophic for vulnerable people around the world. Palestinians are no different from any of us in this room. And in my brief remarks tonight, I hope to somewhat demystify first their condition, and second, their resistance, and third, our relation to them as Canadians. Before going further, though, I do also think it's important to emphasize that the state of Israel has an international right to exist, and the Jewish people have an inherent right to self-determination. But this cannot come at the cost of denying this from the Palestinians. To make sense of the Palestinian experience, and I know that this is not easy, and if this makes you uncomfortable, imagine putting yourself in the Palestinian shoes. For me, I find it helpful to make sense of the Palestinian experience to distinguish between three broad categories uh, or regimes that the Palestinians fall under, as refugees, as Israeli citizens, and as people under occupation. First, the refugees. The refugees come from that crucial year of 1948, when the state of Israel was created and the majority of the Palestinian population was driven from their homes and barred from returning. They are stateless today, disenfranchised, mostly living in built-up refugee camps across the Arab world, today numbering several million. The situation of the refugees is quite different from the situation of a smaller group of Palestinians, the Palestinian citizens of Israel. These are the minority of Palestinians and their descendants who did not flee or lose their homes in 1948. Today they're called the Israeli Arabs, or the Palestinian citizens of Israel, and they number about a fifth of the total population of Israel. They can vote in Israeli elections, they can become judges, hold political office, they have passports and they can travel relatively freely. Compared to other Palestinians, the Israeli Arabs have it pretty good, although they certainly still face significant um, social discrimination and institutional marginalization. In many ways, I think of the situation of the Palestinian citizens inside of Israel as quite comparable to the indigenous people in Canada. They're carrying a lot of you know, they're free on paper, they're e free and equal on paper and before the law, but they're certainly carrying a lot of wounds of historical dispossession and colonization. So the refugees across the region, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, and third, the Palestinians living under occupation. During the 1967 war, Israel went beyond its internationally recognized borders and expanded to take over East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. According to international law, the acquisition of territory by force is inadmissible, and these are occupied Palestinian territories, not part of Israel proper. Under occupation, Palestinians are stateless. They have no passport to anywhere, no vote in the system that controls their lives. They're tried and convicted in Israeli military courts. 
They're held in Israeli military prisons, and their movement is severely restricted by hundreds of checkpoints and by hundreds of kilometers of walls and barriers. Most Palestinians are banned from entering Jerusalem, even West Bank Palestinians who can see the city from their villages and towns, um, as they are also banned from seeing the beaches of the Mediterranean. Um, unless they can obtain notoriously difficult to obtain permits from the military to travel. Complicating the matter, as I'm sure you all know, Israel has built outposts, towns, and, and cities called settlements where Jewish Israelis are encouraged to move at government subsidies. Even though it is illegal under international law for an occupying power to move its own population into occupied territory. But every year, these settlements, as you know, get bigger and bigger, and the settlers now number several hundred thousand or a sizable minority inside of the West Bank. So, what's going on in the West Bank? This means in one land, the West Bank, we have two completely different regimes, two separate systems of laws for two different people one democratic government for the Jewish Israeli settlers, and one military government for the stateless Palestinians under occupation. The settlers are Israeli citizens. Again, they have full legal, civil, political rights. They vote in Israeli elections, while outside of their settlements on the other side of their walls are the stateless Palestinians. And there are severe human rights abuses at the hands of the army and at the hands of extremist settlers. Palestinian crops, cattle, infrastructure, and homes are regularly destroyed. Political activists are detained without charge for months at a time. Soldiers entering homes, soldiers enter bedrooms in the middle of the night to uh, take away youth, children, and young men who are accused of throwing stones. The Gaza Strip has it worst of all, completely blockaded and periodically bombed with drones and fighter jets. All of this is happening in the occupied territories that are supposed to one day become the Palestinian state of a two-state solution. No wonder people are losing faith in the two-state solution as the settlements continue to grow and, and Palestinian uh, territory continues to shrink. It is true that with the Oslo peace talks of the 1990s, these produced the so-called Palestinian authority in the occupied territories. But this is an authority in name only. It does not extend beyond the management of basic social services in a handful of municipalities. Really only one government exercises sovereignty in the occupied territories, and that government is the occupying power, Israel. It still controls all the borders, security, ID systems, resources, currency, birth registries, even the electromagnetic spectrum for cell service and, and uh, Wi-Fi. Of course, Palestinians fight back. They have always resisted, including armed resistance, which is their international right uh, under doctrines of self-defense. They have also resorted to terrorism, which has been well publicized. You are probably all still aware of that period from the 1990s through about the mid-2000s, when Palestinian suicide bombing was very common. It's not anymore. For the most part, today, extensively, for the last 10, 15 years, though very underreported in the West, Palestinians have been focusing on their traditions of non-militarized struggle, civil resistance, grassroots organizing, popular resistance. Unarmed Palestinian struggle has become the norm across the occupied territories, which actually is the subject of my book, which is coming out in a few months. I regret that I don't have it here with me today. In the West Bank, Popular committees, community-based organizations, have led a remarkable campaign against the Israeli separation barrier. They've not succeeded in removing the wall, but in several locations they have uh, succeeded in uh, uh, altering its course, having it segments of it dismantled and pushed back, which has resulted in protecting or restoring the livelihoods of thousands of Palestinians. The major strengths of this anti-wall movement in the West Bank 
is that it's been non-militarized and transnational. Support networks from around the world, including Jews of conscience from Western countries and even some from Israel, added to the power and appeal of this movement by putting their bodies on the ground in the protests and demonstrations. European Union, United Nations institutions, along with global civil society organizations, have established ties with these popular committees. So, uh, in, in fact, in the case of Europe and many European institutions, a lot of these popular committees and the activists associated with them have been designated human rights defenders. And that's a status that means that when they're harmed or detained, you have sort of global networks spring into action, generating instant news stories and press releases and lobbying on their behalf. Probably the most famous of these West Bank uh, popular resistance sites is a small village called Nebisale, home to that 16-year-old girl named Ahed Tamimi, who was jailed for slapping a soldier on her family's property in the West Bank. I did a lot of my research in that village in 2014 because the activists there are leading creative direct actions across the West Bank and also leading the outreach programs and quite effectively to the international community and global civil society. That's why so many of you know her name because they've been busy organizing. It's not just the West Bank. In Jerusalem too, for example, the most spectacular act of mass civil disobedience to happen in the city in many decades happened in the summer of 2017. Some of you may remember this too, when Israel sought to install metal detectors outside of the Temple Mount or outside of the Al-Aqsa compound in the aftermath of an armed attack against Israeli police officers. Well, what happened is the Palestinians in the city refused to accept that change to the holy site. They refused to pass through the metal detectors, so instead, they uh, gathered by the thousands in the streets outside and they held their prayers multiple times a day in the streets of Jerusalem, shut, bringing the city to a standstill. And they demanded that the metal detectors be, re be removed. It was a huge international story and the Israeli public was outraged when the Netanyahu government backed down and removed the metal detectors. Unarmed and participatory struggle has become the norm in Gaza as well. I'm sure you've all heard about those weekly marches that began last spring. Every Friday, thousands of Palestinians in Gaza protest along the heavily fortified boundary with Israel, braving sniper fire to send their message to the world. They demand an end to the blockade and recognition of the Palestinian right of return. Hundreds of, uh, more than 100 unarmed demonstrators have been shot dead and thousands more have been crippled. These new waves of popular struggle have also been global. Palestinians in the occupied territories network with solidarity movements around the world. They're active not only with progressive Jewish groups, with Black Lives Matter, with the organizers of Standing Rock and other anti-pipeline campaigns. And one of the major fronts of Palestinian struggle today, as I'm sure everyone here is aware, is the global campaign to boycott Israel. The BDS movement, as it's formally known, um, is calling for boycotting of Israel until it ceases major violations of Palestinian rights and uh, respects uh, international law. The BDS campaign was launched by Palestinian civil society in 2005, and it started small, but it's become increasingly controversial. Um, we hear a lot about musicians who are pressured by the BDS campaign to not perform in Israel and, and this sort of thing. And I think that we all hear about it because it's effective. It's raising the political and economic and social costs of the status quo. Anyway, these factors, uh, the conditions Palestinians suffer and their adapting modes of struggle have led to increased global sympathy and solidarity. Apart from Israel, the US and a few others the vast majority of countries in the world support Palestinian rights at the United Nations and in their diplomatic foreign policy. A growing list of countries have even recognized Palestine as a state, even though it's a symbolic gesture. More concretely, civil society organizations, church groups, unions, student bodies are opting to divest from companies that profit from the Israeli occupation. And today, Palestinian solidarity movements are actually growing fastest on American university campuses. Yet somehow the Canadian government has completely missed the boat. 
Remarkably, conservative Prime Minister Brian Mulroney stuck his neck out in the 1980s to stand on principle against apartheid in South Africa. But today, neither liberal Justin Trudeau nor NDP Murray Rankin raise a peep about Palestine. Before Stephen Harper, Canada's foreign policy and record of the United Nations voting was in line with most of the rest of the world, calling for respect for international law and for Palestinian rights. With Harper, though, the Canadian government swung into this small rejectionist camp led by the US and Israel. I just a conservative minister, uh, actually, in fact, uh, the Harper government was widely perceived as more pro-Israel than the US, and Israeli diplomats once joked that Canadians were more pro-Israeli than the Israelis. And it was a conservative minister, John Baird, who was the first international diplomat to meet formally with Israeli officials in occupied East Jerusalem, breaking with decades of international precedent, long before Trump came along and declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Stephen Harper once famously serenaded the Netanyahu family by playing Hey Jude at a fancy gala in, in Israel. And notice that there have been no Christia Freeland tweets in support of Palestinian rights. Like she tweeted, for example, in support of Saudi political prisoners. On the contrary, Justin Trudeau himself has tweeted his condemnation of BDS activism on Canadian campuses. And it was Trudeau's liberal government that passed a resolution condemning boycott efforts. So in conclusion, all of this suggests that far from a paragon of human rights champion that we like to believe that we are as, uh, as Canadians, on this issue, Canada is not only not in the lead, but at the very back of the pack and pushing in the wrong direction. Thank you.